Hi everyone, and welcome to a new episode in the Multiverse video series. I'm Javier Luraski, and today we're going to learn how to perform image classification using TensorFlow and Apache Spark. So if you're familiar with uh, Keras, you might already have some good idea on how to perform image classification. So one way of doing it is for you to create your own Keras model, then train it with the images and why not, presumably using ImageNet. And once you have everything trained, perform uh, scoring and figure out how to uh, classify your images with the, uh, with the train model. Now, another way of doing this is to use one of the pre-trained models. So um, if you navigate to keras.rstudio.com, uh, you can then go to articles and navigate to pre-trained models. Now in the pre-trained models section, what you can see is that there's a few models that are ready for you to use. Basically, this means that the Keras and the TensorFlow team, they already pre-trained these models using TensorFlow and Keras and uh, save the output of the graph into a model that is compatible with Keras and TensorFlow such that you don't need to train, you can focus on classification. And this is how that looks like, right? You load the model. Uh, in this case, they're using the ResNet model 50 and you, you load an image and then you predict over the image and you get uh, some probability of uh, that image being associate, associated with one of the ImageNet uh, classes. So this is pretty straightforward. This is what we want to do, uh, but we want to do it at scale. So the question is, how how can you train? Uh, sorry, not how can you classify images if you have a significant amount of images to the point where scoring over a single compute instance is not enough? Now you can you can try using a GPU that usually helps a lot and can speed off computing, but you might also have your data already distributed in a system like HDFS or you might uh, have too much, uh, a, a huge repository of images that need to be classified or analyzed. And for these cases, you can also use um, Apache Spark in combination with Keras. And uh, if you're curious on what exactly ResNet is and what type of model this is, uh, the paper that introduced, it, introduced this model is called uh, Deep Residual Learning for Image Recognition. And uh, ResNet stands for uh, residual network or res, uh, residu residual nets for short. So you're going to see these um, reference in the paper a lot of times, uh, but basically it's just a deep learning model. In this particular case, it, I believe it uses convolutions and the network might look something like this. And again, you, we don't need to worry about how to train this particular model because someone already used Keras and made this model available for us to use. And uh, apparently using, they use the ImageNet dataset, which is great because it has a pretty wide number of uh, classification um, yeah, entries that um, we should be able to find when we're using them against our particular images. Now, the second half of this problem, the way we need to solve this is by using distributed R computation. And the reason why we need to use this is because uh, Apache Spark doesn't support Keras natively. So we need to use some sort of custom code, uh, which you know would end up running Keras to perform a custom trans transformation over the images. So um, if you look at uh, spark.rstudio.com, and then if you look at uh, distributed R computing, you're gonna see this function called Spark Apply, which basically allows you to run arbitrary R code. Now, this function can be pretty straightforward. For instance, in this case, we're just saying create a data frame with five numbers and then transform the data set into itself. So that's pretty easy. But uh, what is interesting here is that this function can be as complicated as you need it to be as long as it's self-contained. That's the only restriction. All right, so uh, in preparation for this video, I set up an EMR cluster uh, an EMR cluster is a service from Amazon Web Services that allows you to provision an Apache Spark cluster in the cloud, even if uh, for a fraction of the cost of actually finding uh, machines and getting them provisioned. If you don't know how to uh, set up Amazon EMR, you can watch some of our previous videos where we introduced um, Spark and setting up an EMR instance. Um, you can also get resources on the spark.rstudio.com site or the Mastering Apache, uh, Apache Spark with R book. 
Um, so yeah, this should be pretty straightforward. Uh, you need to set up an EMR cluster with support for uh, Sparkly R and R, which um, it's well documented. And once you have this cluster, uh, you should be able to arrive to um, RStudio server, which looks like this. And um, then you need to install two packages. You need to install the Sparkly R, which you need to, to connect to uh, Spark. And then you should install also Keras. And you can just do that by saying install Keras, right? That's pretty much it. Uh, that's all I did. And um, yeah, then you want to connect. And uh, in order to connect in this particular for this particular uh, cluster, we would use a master equal yarn since uh, Spark is running on top of yarn in EMR. And then you want to say, uh, well, in this particular case, we have to specify the Spark home, which is under user leave uh, Spark, I believe. Yeah. And there is one caveat. So we're going to be using Keras. Keras uses Python and Python uses virtualenv. Virtualenv requires you to write uh, to the home folder. So uh, this is not going to work out because this is an actual cluster and writing read and write permissions are blocked. So what you want to specify is you want to you, you change the value of the work on home for virtualenv. And the way that you change virtual, uh, the way that you change uh, environment variables in uh, Sparkly R is by saying, uh, well, actually, we, ne we need to create a config. So we say config, and then we're going to specify a few configuration entries, which in this case is just Sparkly R, uh, Sparkly R dot apply dot env. And uh, this would basically set an environment, an environment variable. We want to say work on home equals and some, some uh, path that is accessible for virtual in which would be the temp directory should work. And that's pretty much it. So um, yeah, so we're pretty much connected to, e to connecting to EMR. And we are specifying this particular option, which will allow virtual amp to create virtual environments on a location that is writable. That's pretty much it. There's there's nothing more to it. And once we're done with that, what we can start doing is let's just try this SDF len. Uh, to repartition two. So we're going to get, you know, a uh, small data set repartition by two. And then we're going to run Spark apply. And as, as I mentioned, the function can be as complicated as needed. Um, what we're going to do here, oh, I lost it. Yeah, I did. Uh, what we're going to do here is um, we, we're going to do two things. Well, first of all, we want, we need to load Keras. So let me just type that Spark apply. Uh, function and then we're going to say library keras and then we want to install keras right if we want to be a little bit smarter that we we can be about it uh we we, we could not reinstall keras in if needed uh, but let's just start with this because actually this this is kind of like the hardest part of this setup because we are basically making sure that Keras is properly installed in all our worker nodes. And if Keras is already installed in all our Keras, uh, in all our worker nodes, it's going to be much easier to do predictions because we already have them installed. So as long as this works, uh, we're halfway, halfway there. Yep, so that works, which is great. So now what we want to do is literally, we just want to copy paste uh, the pre-trained code and paste it on, on Spark Apply. Now, we don't have an elephant file, but fortunately, I already stole an elephant URL from Wikipedia. So we'll borrow it from there. So let's just do that. And let's just not, then th we'll return the predictions instead of anything else. So let's just try to run this and hope it works fine. And again, this is, this is our first attempt. So we might have to do some troubleshooting. And if not, um, we'll see. But anyways, so what is what is going on here? Well, we are uh, currently we're hard coding, uh, you know, just one image to classify, and we're passing it to Keras, and Keras is retrieving the predictions. Uh, however, we can very easily after we after we figure out and troubleshoot if this works out properly, 
we can very easily change this URL to be passed uh, as under Spark Apply, which would allow us to basically scale across you know thousands, millions, or billions of images, right? Like we would only be constrained to how many compute resources we have to perform classification or even to reduce classification time. Right, so something failed, which, you know, it's still expected. Ah, yes. So, so what is going on here? Well, the problem is that we forgot to download the image. So I think what we want to do is we want to say, I just call this URL. Uh, and it, the name doesn't matter, you know, uh, the name is not used for classification. So we can just call it data and then retry this. All right, so let's give it another shot. Uh, yeah, again, so the problem before was that uh, Keras doesn't know how to load image URLs. You need to download the image on your own. And the original code that we have here assumes that um, the image file is already available, which uh, might not be the case, but in our case, what we're doing is we're rather downloading it from a particular URL. Well, let's just give this a second. And again, um, this is taking an actual, it's not, it doesn't, it's not taking a long time, but it does take quite some time to uh, load ResNet and initialize Keras. One of the things that we should do is, yeah, okay, wait a second. Yep, this looks great. So yeah, so as you can see here, we uh, it's getting classified as an elephant. It has two entries because we have two partitions. We're currently not using any real images but we can fix that quite easily as follows. So let's create a data frame with two URLs. Let's call it images. So write that properly. And let's retry, oh, actually before that, let's just copy images, copy to uh, images. We just need to copy the images to Spark and we're not copying the images, but the URLs. And um, we just repartition these by two. Yeah, so this is just copying this, this very simple data set of two images to make it more realistic. And then instead of hard coding this, um, what we can do is we can say e URL. Yeah, so as you can see, the data set contains a column named URL. So let's just say e URL, and then we don't need this anymore. We do, we do still need to download the image. And yeah, that's that should be it, I think. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so basically, what we're doing now is we're now we're oh, sorry, I forgot about this. Um, we actually need to change these to images, right? So images is the name of our actual data set, and now we're applying our Spark apply function, and uh. Yeah, and instead of using the hard-coded elephant image, now we're using a proper small, very small data set. Yeah, so this, this is a bit better. If you want to kind of like keep track of what's going on, you can uh, open the Spark UI, which in, in the case of EMR, the proxies are not set automatically. So you need to override this and apparently, all things have gone wrong here, maybe. Let's try see what's going on. And let's just give it a few more seconds. And um, yeah, so basically, let's see. Right, let's run this again. Uh, I shouldn't have stopped the other, the other instance. Uh, E.URL, images. Now let's just, let's just make sure that it only has one element. Um, yeah, so we want to make sure that as well, first of all, we're, we're not writing vectorized code here yet is mostly assuming that there's only one image being downloaded. The next step, what we want to do is we want to actually vectorize this particular uh, code such that each partition gets processed uh, without having to reload the ResNet model or without having to even reinstall Keras. So I already have a little script that, um, kind of like does that for us, but I wanted to make sure that we have the basics working before we use the vectorized version, uh, which honestly, it's not super interesting. The vectorized version, all it does is loops through each, all, 
loads the model and it and then loops over the images. Right, so this this is pretty much it. At this point, you have uh, Keras working in a distributed environment uh, with three nodes, even though we're only using two partitions. And you can see here that the first image is an African elephant, and the second one is likely to be a koala. Uh, now we can uh, we can kind of like spend some time refactoring this code and making it a little bit more um, usable. And that's exactly what I did here, which uh, I'll, I'll share this gist on the GIF, GitHub video. But basically, all, all I'm doing here is I'm creating, I'm creating an, a helper function that looks very similar to the one that we have. And it's basically allowing you, us to process multiple images after we load the model. So it's pretty much the same, and you know it just adds a little, adds vectorization, vectorization support, and also it only returns the um, the top one result, which is useful because we honestly don't care that much about everything else. Now I have a more interesting data set somewhere in here, which us which is just. Uh, image predictions, uh, sorry, not image predictions. It should be, actually, I should be able to get up. I think I have a pin somewhere in here. Yeah, so we can, we have a, a, a data set that is a little bit more interesting, which uh, what I did is I went to, I used the rtweet package to get uh, 10,000 of the images that are, sorry, 10,000 of the tweets from the hashtag deep learning community, which looks like this. And yeah, so it only has about a thousand images, but you know, like we don't really know what the images are. So in order to do some proper data analysis of these, uh, you know, of the hashtag deep learning, um, you know, entries in Twitter, you know, like we need to use some sort of like a classification if, uh, you know, if, if the data set is, is, is bigger. So we can do the same. We can copy this data set into, let's just overwrite it. Uh, we can... Uh, copy this data set into Spark, and then we can use our new function that is now vectorized, mm -hmm. and we can process the entire of the data set. Well, actually, let's just, let's just run a subset. Uh, we can just run 10 images, and then we are gonna pick the prediction, and that's about it. So yeah, so we, you know, in this case, we're getting a bigger, bigger data set that contains a thousand images. And you know, we only, we're only using two partitions, and uh, you know, but we can we can scale this to you know like many many more instances. We can also use multiple CPUs uh, with multiple executors. So there's a lot of room for just optimizing this particular setup. But what is important to notice here is that uh, this worked out. So we can see that some of the images that are being tweeted uh, are about a match stick. I don't know what that is. A website, an envelope, a website, a website, an oscilloscope website, a castle, spider web, and a monitor. Monitor. So that those are kind of like the images that are getting processed. If you want to process them all, then all you need to do is basically just uh, replace this with images. So you would run this and you would basically get the output of uh, categorizing all the images. Well, not all the images, but the first 10,000 tweets in the uh, deep learning community in Twitter. Um, the output looks mostly like this, uh, read RDS, just to save us some time. And you can see that there is um, multiple ones. We can use afterwards, use the plier, just to group them by um, the prediction. And then figure out kind of like what, uh, how this looks like. Yeah, so you can definitely do some some analysis here, and this is misspelled. We're not gonna do too much analysis, but I might I might post a few images with how this looks like, and uh, yeah, we might want to also arrange them just to see which is the the most popular image in Twitter, which you know. Um, so let's just take a quick look here, and that should be it. So as you can see here, apparently in Twitter, what gets tweeted more about are images about websites, which is not surprising. Envelope, which my guess is that this is not very interesting, and some other ones. 
All right, well, I hope this video was interesting. I'll make the gist uh, available for you to follow up the code if you want to. And um, yeah, looking forward for additional videos. Thank you.